We are here with Lisa Borders. Did we have the forms and everything? Did you get? I the did, copy and of the I'm going to sign them for you right now. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. Um, we have to ask for the form signature because we are, after all, a state sure. university. Sure, 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 sure. The sure. first one you have there is simply informed consent, saying we're going to ask you questions. Don't believe you'll be harmed in the process. <laughs> And if you just put a signature, I can fill in the rest of the okay. information there. Sounds like the hospital is what we do to all the patients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are going to operate on you. Are you okay with that? And then this one simply asks your permission to record the conversation. Sure. But we don't think there'll be any side effects. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And no then, collateral damage. Mm -hmm. The third simply asks, or simply conveys the content of our recording to the university archives for sure. preservation, because we hope people 100 years from now will want to know what was going on in Atlanta, Georgia in this time period, and use this as a resource. Yeah, the time capsule, Pete, that's yes. kind of a... So, we're excited, and thank you for your willingness to sit down with us today. Certainly. We usually ask people about how they came to live in Atlanta, and I know you have a deep, long-standing <laughs> connection to the city. She has a grandfather with a street name. Um, how I came to live in Atlanta. My parents are from Atlanta, and I was born to an Atlanta family would probably be the answer uh, to that. It was, it was my good fortune. I came out of the lucky gene pool to be born in Atlanta to be born to a family in Atlanta. But you had an opportunity to get away to study and to come back to Atlanta and a conscious decision to live here sure. and make your career here. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Well, I think the influence of not only the family but the events that occurred in Atlanta while I was growing up left an indelible uh, impression on me as a person. Uh, we are the cradle of the civil rights movement and my grandfather, the Reverend Dr. William Holmes Borders was the patriarch of the family and many of us in the family, in fact probably all of us in the family, walk in that very long shadow of his contributions and his philosophical bent that said we are our brother's keeper uh, and we are responsible to do our civic duty, whatever that be, whatever ministry uh, we profess. He was a traditional minister and had his uh, church and his flock, but each of us have chosen a different path and that has become our ministry in this great city. Okay. Um, and your own career path, how, was, how would you describe the events that uh, led you to where you are now? Well, I think I would tell you that my parents were probably one of the greatest influences in addition to my grandfather. My mother put my father through medical school and had four children, so that in and of itself was a huge contribution to the family. Uh, but she was also a tremendous civic volunteer in Atlanta. She was born here. She was a Grady baby. She understood uh, what was happening in the South during her lifetime, and she wanted to raise her children in the New South. Uh, but what she also also recognized is that she had an obligation to be a part of the change in Atlanta and in the Deep South. And so looking at her example uh, was something that also left a tremendous impression on me. My father was a physician. He was a an internist here in Atlanta for over 50 years, and his ministry was health care and he helped the underserved. His office was on what was then Hunter Street, which is today Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. My grandfather built that building so that my father, his sister, and his sister's husband could all practice together in a building that they owned and did not have to pay rent. They paid rent to themselves. Um, the grandchildren actually owned the building. So there was much thought in this family about how do you continue a legacy of service, how do you become self-sufficient. And I think those lessons, I'm the oldest grandchild of six, and I think those lessons from my grandfather and my parents were what helped shape me as an individual and my career path both personally and professionally. Say some more about your grandfather and sort of how strategic he was and what his sort of vision was both for 
the community in Atlanta and, and for his family. Absolutely. Uh, my grandfather was a very unique person. I think that he was a visionary before I knew how to spell the word or appreciated the impact that he was having. I mentioned he was a traditional minister, and you think of a minister with a church and a flock, and they work with inside the confines of the four walls of the church, and you come to church on Sunday. That's not how he viewed it. He mm -hmm. viewed that as the pinnacle of the week, and he mm -hmm. gave his sermon. He used to write the titles for all of his sermons at the beginning of the year. Mm. every single one for all 52 Sundays and he posted them on a board outside a painted large wooden board so you knew on any sermon on any Sunday what the sermon was going to be and there was actually a thought process behind the impact of those sermons so what he also believed is that the church needed to work beyond the confines of the four walls of the physical structure and that the ministry needed to permeate the community. So when he saw a challenge in the community, and in his lifetime it was everything from affordable housing to financial literacy, just like it is today, which is so fascinating, he understood that he and his flock needed to address those issues. Civil rights was sort of the overarching issue of the day. Affordable housing, financial literacy, and accessibility to money and resources were the um, I guess the, the pieces that came out of civil rights, civil rights or the lack thereof precluded the African American race from having the ability to get to affordable housing or accessible money. And so his whole effort was to bring the church out into the community and bring it to life through the uh, struggles of the people and to mitigate those struggles. So for example, he started a credit union. One of the first church-founded credit unions in the nation was founded at the church because he wanted folks to be able to borrow money, to pool their own assets, to be able to borrow from one another. Today we call that microfinancing. Mm -hmm. The Grameen Bank is probably one of the most famous for that concept, but he was doing it in the 1940s. The church, when he inherited the actual physical structure, was in what today we would call the basement. They called it the first unit. Mm -hmm. And he built the second area, which is today called the main sanctuary. Mm -hmm. uh, he built it ahead of schedule for cash under budget, mm -hmm. which today would be called sound financial planning. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I think about the affordable housing that he built in the 1950s and 1960s, the church still today is the largest landowner in the Auburn Avenue corridor because he bought up all the acreage surrounding the church. Mm -hmm. And then he actually went to the federal government and negotiated monies to build the housing project. That housing project was one of the first, and still today, one of the largest in the country. It was Wheat Street Gardens. Wheat Street Gardens, right. And there was Wheat Street 1, Wheat Street 2, and Wheat Street 3, which were the three phases of development. Interestingly enough, the person who built the housing project with him, Tom Cousins, mm. which I did not know mm. until I went to work for Mr. Cousins in like 2002. Mm. Uh, so 50 years later, mm. no one told that story, mm. and Mr. Cousins didn't even tell me until I had been working for him for a couple of years, and mm. it was just one day over lunch, and he said, you know, I know your people. And I was like, my people? Mm. Well, your grandfather, I built a housing project. Now, I thought he meant because I went to high school with his kids. His mm -hmm. oldest daughter was in my class. That's not what he meant at all. It was a very long relationship. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather was light years ahead of his time. The church had 3,000 members. He had what I would call one of the first mega churches before that term mm -hmm. was coined. And he recognized that he had a bully pulpit and that he had an opportunity to do magnificent work beyond the confines of the church. He also was a key person in the voter registration drive in the late 1940s that helped reshape Atlanta's politics. That's exactly right. The voter registration drive um, desegregating the Magnolia Room at Riches. Uh, desegregating buses in Atlanta, 
getting the first African-American police officers their jobs with the city of Atlanta. Uh, he even negotiated, they changed their clothes at the Butler Street Y because they were not allowed to go to the police department and change their clothes. He was arrested any number of times. Martin Luther King was still a teenager and he was getting arrested. Uh, the most famous picture of him that I enjoy is a picture with him standing in the doorway of a jail cell with his coat on, his winter coat, he was gorgeous, and his fedora, and his hand was in his pocket, and he was in jail, but he was not actually in the cell, nor was the cell door closed, because the powers that be were afraid that they would turn him into a martyr. Mm -hmm. So he was never mistreated that I can recall. Perhaps some things mm -hmm. did happen, but all the pictures that I saw or stories I was told, he went to jail numerous times, uh, but Ivan Allen and others understood that if he were mistreated, it would be a really bad day in Atlanta. And what was that? What was the occasion? Do you know of that photograph? It was desegregating the buses, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, I think part of the discussion about the policemen and their jobs came as a result mm -hmm. of the desegregation of the buses. Um, many civil rights rallies were held at Wheat Street. Skip Mason has done an extraordinary mm -hmm. job of documenting everything from concerts by Mahalia Jackson mm -hmm. to Mattawilda Dobbs to uh, Louis Farrakhan speaking at mm -hmm. Wheat Street when no one else would allow them to do so. He opened the church and said this is the sanctuary where the guarantee of freedom of speech mm -hmm. and the right to assemble will be manifested. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand this at 10 years old, 12 years old, 14 years old. And it took me until I was almost out of college mm -hmm. to understand who he was and what he had done. To me, Andrea, just like mm -hmm. your dad is mm -hmm. your dad, mm -hmm. but your dad is like mm -hmm. an ambassador, mm -hmm. a mayor, a congressman. He was her dad. Mm -hmm. This was just my mm -hmm. grandfather, and he was that was his work. That's what he did. So whether it was leading a demonstration or sweeping the street literally with a broom mm -hmm. on Auburn Avenue, it was just grandpapa, and he was doing what he does. At 20, I can remember traveling to England for a singing tour, and one of the ministers there at Westminster Abbey, when we were introduced, heard my last name, and he said, are you related to the clergyman? Hmm. And I said, I had to think for a minute, what's clergyman, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't call them clergymen. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, you mean my grandfather? Yeah, he's a preacher in Atlanta. Okay, so he had been across the pond and had had a relationship and made an impression in England, and I was like, wonder when he came over here. But I was a kid. I had no idea mm -hmm. uh, of the impact that he had made and where he had been and all the people he had worked with. What do you mean sweeping the street in, uh, on Auburn Avenue? He believed that if he were the pastor, he had to be the example for what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. So whether it was preaching on Sunday morning or whether it was picking up the trash, if it needed to be done, he didn't mm -hmm. tell other people to do it. He would mm -hmm. just do it himself. So I don't know where the picture is today, but I do remember seeing it as a little girl of him sweeping the street in front of the church because mm -hmm. it needed to be swept. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and he was very good about doing things when he saw that they needed to be done. He never procrastinated and he never made excuses. Uh, in his mind, and he used to tell me this, excuses are the tools of incompetence that build monuments to nothing. Mm. So he didn't believe in making excuses, just get it done and just do it yourself. So economic development, self-sufficiency, civil rights, Whatever he saw that needed to be done in his mind, that was a manifestation of his ministry, and he would just go about doing it and leading others to do so. He would set the example, and he couldn't envision that someone would not do their part. Mm -hmm. That just was how the world turned. Mm -hmm. right? Tell me a little bit about your career upon returning as a young person from college. How did you get started in your Sure, sure. When I returned to Atlanta from college, I actually married right out of college. I had more guts than brains, Professor. But I returned from college, uh, married and with a young child. My son was actually born in Boston. My then husband was in medical school at Tufts. He graduated. We came back. He got his residency at Grady. Um, and I started to work for what was then CNS Bank uh, in the trust department. 
uh, on the trading desk. Uh, so I learned stocks and bonds on a, at a very early age. Um, subsequently, I divorced, so I ended up being a single mother for the rest of, of my son's life. And what I recognized is that I had had a child, I had a responsibility to that child, but I also had a responsibility to my community. But I think as a young person, 24, 25 years old, all I was trying to do was live paycheck to paycheck, quite frankly. Um, that's what we're all trying to do when we're that young, and you really don't know what's going on in the world, or you think you know everything and you really know absolutely nothing. So my grandfather was still alive, obviously, at that time, and I remember him telling me, you decided not to go to medical school like your father and your aunt, so you've got to decide how you're going to be sufficient and self-sufficient. How are you going to take care of this child? And he was pretty brutal. This was tough love. It's like you made a decision, there are consequences, and so you're going to have to deal with this. We will help you, but you will be on the tip of the spear. Um, and so I went about cultivating my career at the bank, uh, and that is a it was a wonderful experience. Banks don't pay very well, mm -hmm. let me just say that. Um, so I was there for seven years or something, six years, and then left to run a physician practice up at uh, Northside Hospital, which my father just thought was the most horrible thing in the world. I wasn't going to be a doctor. I was going to work on the business side of medicine. What the heck are you <laughs> thinking? I didn't pay all this money for you to go to Duke and to go to independent schools for you to work for somebody else because my father was a physician. He was an entrepreneur. He hung his own shingle. That was a difficult time for me because I did not appear to be meeting expectations for my family. My father was very angry with me. I had gotten married, so I was dependent on a man. I hadn't gone to medical school. I didn't have a clear path to making money. Um, so it was a it was a very tumultuous time for me. My stomach used to hurt every time I had to go to dinner and deal with my father. Um, because in our family, you went to school and you did things. You didn't just maintain the, the status quo. Uh, as it turned out, that group of physicians, it was five doctors at the time, we introduced nurse midwives to the hospital at Northside and we drove that group to the largest group in the state of Georgia. So I very quickly understood that whatever I was doing, it had to be the best, if for no other reason I could make my father be quiet, uh, but more importantly so I could be comfortable with who I was, that I was doing my very best decided to go get a master's degree at that point in health administration. Another thing just to make my father be quiet, but more importantly because I recognized that what I was doing in that practice was cutting edge and without that additional piece of paper no one would ever believe that I had done the things that I was doing. Mm -hmm. So the group started out, for example, grossing $1 million a year. By the time I left it was almost $5 million a year. We were delivering the most babies. We had brought, brought Nurse Midwifery to Northside, which was then becoming Baby Town USA. Today they deliver more babies than anybody else in the country. So that was a big deal. Uh, when I left there, I went to a public company that was working through the dot-com uh, situation in the 1980s, right? And I found that this was a medical data company that was traded on the NASDAQ, so it was a small cap company, uh, but it was publicly traded. And so I began this uh, foray into real public sector stuff, right, where you have uh, restrictions and regulations by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. And I learned an awful lot. I worked there for almost five years, and that company ended up going belly up and having to file bankruptcy. It went from dot-com to dot-bomb, mm -hmm. uh, and I ended up taking that company through a bankruptcy proceeding. Now, I don't know many people who can say that. It wasn't a pleasant experience, mm -hmm. but that enabled me to get my next job. So it was one of those breakthrough opportunities that I had Mr. Cousins say to me, I don't care about how much money you made. I want to know how you got yourself out of trouble. Mm -hmm. I want to know if you paid off your debts which we actually had done. So the dot-com company that had gone dot-bomb owed Bank of America, then Bank of America, $30 million. And I said, all right, I think I can get it for you. It's going to be 50 cents on the dollar, though. It's not going to be a dollar for a dollar. The woman who had this conversation with those of us who were officers at that company, when we went to Bank of America in Charlotte, where they're headquartered today, 
The guy who was the president continued to talk to the gentleman at the end of the table. He was not the right person. It was the woman sitting to his left. Mm -hmm. I never opened my mouth because I wasn't supposed to be talking. The woman finally said, I don't want to hear from you anymore. When she finally spoke up, she goes, I want to know what you do. Mm -hmm. And I said, what I do? Mm -hmm. Okay, here's what I did. She said, can you take this company through bankruptcy? I said, I don't know, but I'm worth willing to give it a try. We took it through bankruptcy. I did get 50 cents on the dollar. We returned $15 million to Bank of America. They had written down this loan completely, which means the bank had assumed they would get zero money. They got $15 million. That lady got a very big bonus that year. She and I are very good friends <laughs> to this day. Uh, Hugh McCall was the chairman at the time at Bank of America. He also sat on the Cousins board. See how God works. And Mr. Cousins called him and said, is it true that this company returned $15 million to your bank? Hugh went and asked somebody, and they said yes. I got my job at Cousins Properties. So everyone says you had a real estate background? Absolutely not. Couldn't spell it, didn't understand it, had no idea. What was interesting to Mr. Cousins is that under adverse circumstances, I made the best of it, paid the money back that I could pay back and that I had committed to. And more importantly, he knew my people. And this is how I found out that he built the housing project with my grandfather. So the rest is history. You all know it. I worked at Cousins and then ultimately ran uh, for public office and spent some time in the public arena. And that was a manifestation of watching my grandfather, who ran for office three different times and was never successful. Um, and I decided I was going to do it, following the path of Maynard Jackson, who had launched his political career in my grandfather's pulpit. Uh, and so it was fascinating to run for office, win office, get to City Hall and recognize mm -hmm. it was a bigger problem than I expected. Uh, and, but the learning curve was, was not, the arch was not very long. So living in this city, watching the people who had come before me and who had done great things, your father, Maynard Jackson, and many, many others um, was probably, it, it's the sentinel things that, that made me who I am today and why I enjoy helping others no matter what I'm doing. So at Cousins, I handled marketing for the country, but I also ran the Cousins Foundation. So I could ensure that some of our profits went into areas that helped serve the community. When Cousins was developing in the city, I was the one that said, no, don't take down all the trees, or if we have to take down the trees, let's give them to this particular park. Red Tip Fatinias came where the Terminus Project is today. Those went over to a park in the north side of town. Uh, so we didn't waste them, we didn't grind them up, uh, we actually use them. So I've tried to be a good steward of community resources, and wherever I have worked, have tried to make sure that the community benefited as we benefited as a company, whoever that might have been at the time. Sorry for a long one. That's a wonderful answer. <laughs> I think you and I met when you were working with the foundation side of things for exactly. Mr. Cousins. That's been a while ago. We won't sure. say exactly. It's a good thing. It's a long relationship. We've known each other. But uh, tell me a little bit more about your work at City Hall. What did you feel like you were able to accomplish as president of the Atlanta City Council? Sure. Um, thank you for that question. It was a. Um, it was a fun ride, it really was. But I will tell you, when I went there, it was uh, best described as dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. The city council did not work together. There were constant uh, battles between the legislative branch and the executive branch. You might recall that this was a time we had the water crisis and how would we repair the infrastructure in Atlanta. We hadn't had it repaired for 50 years, which is two generations. Uh, the water rates were going to be astronomical. It was just a tough time. And everyone thinks that this last recession was very hard. Atlanta has always weathered storms. And what we've tried to do, I think cooler hail heads ultimately always prevail. And so Mayor Franklin at the time was leading the charge to have the infrastructure redone. So I found a dysfunctional council. They were dysfunctional amongst themselves and they were complete adversaries to the mayor. So the first thing I set about doing was building consensus between the council members first and then between the uh, legislative and executive branches. That 
had to be done or I felt we could never get anything else done. We were just talking about water when I first got there, but I said this will have a dramatic and negative impact on everything that we do. And so once we got that calmed down, and it took about a year to get that done, mm -hmm. to have people not only respect you, but trust your judgment and come to you and ask questions about, well, why should we do it this way? And why doesn't it make sense for me to get my way all the time? I was elected to lead my district. Well, if you get your way all the time, they don't ever get their way, and then that district will suffer. And trying to get people to understand the strategic picture about the city. It's not just about one district. It's about the city and how that all works together. So changing the tenor and the tone would probably be, it's an intangible that people sometimes do not understand, but they recognize in today's environment where it has gone askew once again, that, oh my goodness, things were very smooth for five years there and a lot got done. All the budgets that we passed, and I think there were four balanced budgets that we passed while Mayor Franklin was in office, that type of uh, financial stewardship had not been exhibited since your father's time and Maynard's time when there was plenty of money and people were more agreeable. So making sure that the city was on sound financial footing for the vast majority of the time that Mayor Franklin was in office was very important to me. Bringing the Beltline to fruition and helping to be the champion for that, I think, is going to distinguish Atlanta uh, as having a second project, Atlantic Station being the first, that no one else has in the country. Mm -hmm. And it is an environmentally sensitive project, but it's also an economic development mm -hmm. project. It's going to take 20 years, 24 years or so to totally come to fruition, but laying that groundwork and standing as a champion when others said it couldn't be done, this is crazy, why would you guys go off on this tangent? I was an early adopter, believed in it, and carried the water and helped Mayor Franklin get that across the line. Um, the ethics legislation that was in place when I got there uh, was Mayor Franklin's baby, so I take no credit for it, but I do take credit for carrying that torch. Uh, we had many folks who were having challenges in their offices, <laughs> and I just said, okay, you can do that if you want to. I will call you out on this. I will not stand idly by and allow you to break the law or hide money or do crazy things. This is public money. You should manage it better than you manage your own, and so I'm just not going to stand by and do that. So when we think about big projects, I would tell you the fifth runway was done on our watch. Uh, the Delta lease renewal was done on our watch. Hartsfield-Jackson is the largest economic engine and the most uh, prolific economic engine in the southeast and perhaps anywhere in the country right now, 90 million people coming through the airport every day. So making sure that the airport was on sound financial footing, pushing back on the state in a very public way every time they reached over and tried to take it or pretend they were going to try and take it was very important. That fifth runway was an impact to not only Atlanta and the southeast but the country. Uh, without it, planes were late all across the country. So that construction project and making sure that Atlanta was in control of that airport and that everyone had an opportunity to bid on the, the uh, contracts out there, the minority piece of the airport and making sure everyone was represented and had a full opportunity per to participate, which was a legacy of Maynard Jackson and Andy Young. We wanted to make sure that what was birthed here in Atlanta and was used as a template everywhere else, that we actually shepherded and stewarded our good resources and our good programs. Um, so standing as uh, the century at the door is what uh, my colleagues used to call me uh, because I made sure every rule was followed. That's just who I was. So whether it was running the council meetings on time, I am proud to say, 98% of the council meetings started on time and ended on time. Um, that's important for doing the people's business, not wasting people's time, uh, making sure that people were nice to each other. I will add parenthetically, this was a major cultural shift at City Hall. Thank a you. timely meeting mm. of the City Council. Mm. These things frequently went, what, 12 hours? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Seriously. Right. No, yeah. and it makes it very, very difficult for citizens who want to have input. That's exactly right. Because you have to go camp out there for right. two days. Right. The business of the city took place around midnight. Yeah. And that's, that's right. That's not a good yeah. 
That's right. So culture. what I told folks, particularly those that I had worked with, is I brought more of a corporate culture in terms of timeliness. Now, a city is not a business in the traditional sense, but it is a business in the sense that you are working for all the citizens who elected you. And so honoring those people and what you were sent there to do was really important mm -hmm. to me. And frankly, my colleagues then at council they very, it's Pavlovian, I guess. They eventually got on board because if they didn't come on time, I would call their names out on TV and say they had an unexcused absence and we were keeping <laughs> records and I found a way, either a, a, you know, a stick or a carrot, to get you to behave, get in your chair on time, make your comments in your 10 minutes. No, Mr. Martin, your time has expired <laughs> on this topic. You may not continue. Next speaker. Uh, no one had ever done that before, believe it or not. They had just allowed people to sort of do whatever they wanted to do. Uh, no, there are rules and we need to follow them. So the, the structure and the rigor with which uh, I tried to run the council meetings and just govern myself. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the only person's behavior you can affect is your own, right? So if you can affect your own behavior and serve as a good model, then hopefully people will see that and, and will follow. So I would say from an economic standpoint, whether it was the airport or the Beltline, uh, we were very instrumental in making sure that the city would move forward. The financial basis, saving money, we changed the fiscal year, we changed uh, the automation of the finance department, which there was a whole lot of administrative, non-glamorous things that we did that was absolutely necessary. It's like cleaning your house before someone comes for dinner or cleaning mm -hmm. out the garage because it needs to be painted. Nobody wants to do it, but everyone wants to enjoy the clean house or the clean garage or the party afterwards. Right. Um, and so Shirley Franklin and I, she dubbed herself the, the sewer mayor. Um, my colleagues would call me the sentry at the door, and they often called me Florence Nightingale because any time a first responder was hurt, a police officer or a firefighter, you could count on me to be there. As soon as I knew about it, that I would be there whether the mayor was in town or not. Uh, my favorite thing still to this day, when I have a bad day, is to go ride on a fire engine. Uh, because they work with everyone in the city and they are typically working with those who have no real resources. And so it puts life in perspective. When you go in someone's house who has no food or no electricity or no heat, you recognize that whatever it was you were upset about is ridiculous and that you have the ability, the capacity, the resources to get what you need. These people do not. And so to this very day, I can go in any fire station and have a meal. Firefighters are very good cooks, by the way. <laughs> but more importantly, I have my own red jacket, which I keep mm -hmm. in my car. It's mm -hmm. my fire gear that the firefighters bought for me. Mm -hmm. And I ride whenever I feel like it. Mm -hmm. And even coming out of office, I went to the chief of the fire department and said, can I still ride? And mm -hmm. he said, absolutely, mm -hmm. we'd be honored to have you. Mm -hmm. And so that's still my connection to the city, my unofficial connection, is riding with the firefighters uh, on a regular basis. The police officers get jealous, and I say, well, you just give me a bulletproof vest? They give me a big red truck, and I get to <laughs> climb up on the truck, put on my boots and my jacket, and I can be out all night long, be exhausted the next day, but be absolutely inspired uh, about this city and about what they do in terms of saving lives. That's what they do, and they're really good at it, so I love being a spectator. So when you traveled around, uh, particularly doing marketing with cousins, what's the view of Atlanta from sure. out there? Um, the view of Atlanta is we are the New South, we're the international city. We dubbed ourselves so, but there was a lot of hard work. Andrew, as you know, by your father to make it so that people would see us on an international stage, not just on a national stage. There was a lot of work done on integration versus segregation back when Maynard first ran for mayor in the 1970s. So your father continued that legacy, but put it quite a few stakes in the ground himself, whether it was making a deal with Marriott so that we had adequate hotel rooms at different price points. He was quite the visionary, didn't understand that till I was about 40 years old. I was like, oh, you can have the Ritz-Carlton, or you can have the Marriott Marquis, or you could have the Suites, or you could, but I didn't get that. So there was market segmentation and there was preparation for us to be the international city. So we don't just have the airports, we've actually got the hotel rooms for conventions and for trade shows and sporting events. 
it's fabulous. It's absolutely fabulous. So when people talk about Atlanta, and I have lots of friends in Washington and D.C. who say it's not Washington or mm -hmm. New York, mm -hmm. and I go, you're right. Mm -hmm. It's Atlanta mm -hmm. because we are special. And to come through Atlanta, you got to come through Atlanta to get anywhere. My grandfather used to say you had to come through Atlanta to get to heaven mm -hmm. because we've got the airport. So people see us as a new place. They also see us as an outlier to the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. We are one city that's perhaps the blue city in the Red Sea mm -hmm. of Georgia. 159 counties, grossly inefficient, grossly ineffective. We've never had, other than John Lewis, anyone who has been in office at the federal level for a very long time, like a Ted Kennedy, who's able to sit as a powerful committee member or chair, whether it's finance or agriculture or whatever it is. We've not had that. We are just starting to get that which means we have been a donor state. We have contributed more money federally than we have received on many, many fronts, from federal highways to you name it. The only place that that was probably, or there is an exception for sure, is on MARTA. When we received the money for public transportation originally, we were one of the first cities to step forward and say, we believe in public transportation, and your dad helped lead that fight, obviously, with Charlie Loudermill. So when we think about Atlanta, we think a certain way, but the others who perceive us see us as the gateway to what we call the New South. We have to constantly remind people, though, because Atlanta is still such a small piece of a much bigger state. And when we have laws like the voter ID or what's now coming to fore with immigration, people see us, frankly, as backward. When we had folks running for governor in the last election, I think four of the five people didn't have college degrees. Yeah. Now that's not to say you always have to have a college degree, but the perception is you're not educated in the state of Georgia. When you look at the public school system and our kids were doing so poorly in terms of graduation rates just from high school, we're not even talking about college, people say, well, do we have an educated workforce that we can draw from? If I'm Johnson & Johnson or Clorox or Mercedes or whoever trying to put a plant here or trying to put a department here or trying to put a company base here, where am I going to draw from? You know, what are we going to do? So they see us as being visionary and being, um, I think, ahead of our time a generation ago. Mm. Today, I think they ask the question, where is the leadership? And are you going to continue with the bold vision that you had? For example, our transportation today is just terrible, mm -hmm. right? So we had MARTA, that was 30 years ago. We really haven't invested heavily in public transportation. We haven't upgraded, we haven't supported them publicly from a state level, not dramatically in any way. And I'm not talking about those little breeze cards that the state paid for. We have not thought about, or it doesn't seem that we have thought about, who are we when we grow up, right? We decided in our adolescence that we were going to be a transportation town and a real estate town, and all of those things have been realized and have been extraordinarily good for us. But today, in the economic environment, with the bottom having fallen out of the real estate market, we are hurting. We are hurting badly. Because we didn't have the foresight to continue to invest in MARTA, now we are behind cities like Portland and San Francisco and Chicago and New York. And agreed, agreed, Chicago and New York are much older cities than we are. So they've got some legacy issues to deal with. On the other hand, we don't have legacy issues to deal with. So what's your problem? What's your issue? You're just not bright enough or you don't take the time to think strategically about what industry is going to need or what everyday Jane and John Q. Citizen is going to need. So people see us as a city that aspires to be great now. We had our day in the sun during civil rights. We absolutely were a leader. We had so many Fortune 500 companies come and headquarter here. Many of them have undergone consolidations and have been acquired. Think AT&T, think Georgia Pacific. AT&T moved their headquarters to Texas. Georgia Pacific was taken private by the Koch brothers, K-O-C-H. So when you think about that, we have become almost a regional outpost. So there are regional hubs here for AT&T and folks like them. But we still have a solid group of people like UPS and Coca-Cola. But there used to be so many more. So the question becomes, what makes us attractive and how do we 
uh, modulate our environment vis-a-vis -vis healthcare, transportation, so that our worker base is able to move from point A to point B, so that they are solid citizens, bowl of food when they come in the morning having had their breakfast and ready to work. You can't do that with a 25% poverty rate. Mm -hmm. So from a public policy perspective, we are seen as deficient. Let me say it that way. I'm not going to try to grade us. I will just tell you we were seen as deficient. The church in the old days was one of the best places that you could find the spokespersons for the entire community, not just the African American community. Today there is a deafening silence from the church, and in particular the black church. And I say this on a regular basis to all my minister friends. I'm like, where are you? You know, what are you doing? Please step up, stand together. I watched the evangelicals anoint, if you will, Rick Santorum the other night on TV. So the religious right, which is an extreme group, has now taken hold of the Republican Party and of those who would aspire to the White House. That's very scary to me, not because I'm a Democrat, but because there's a deafening silence on the other side. And so I'm waiting to hear the rabbis, the imams, the ministers in the black church stand up and go, hey, just a minute, we have something to say. That's not happening today. That's sort of unique in the Bible Belt here, but it's not happening. So public policy, I think, is a challenge for us. We are seen as the star that's shining out in the hinterland because we've got the airport and we beacon, that is a beacon for folks to come here. Once they get here, they're not quite as enamored as they would have been. They are enamored with our history. They are uncomfortable with our present, and they are questioning our future. Sorry, another long-winded answer? Nothing wrong with that. This is tremendous. This that's, is a good, uh, I mean, that's a good assessment. And I guess, so I guess then, one, the, sort of what, what is the sort of vision of the Beltline and how it fits in then to, to addressing some of these challenges? Sure. And then, yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. Yeah. Um, the Beltline, as I see it, is an economic engine, as I mentioned, second only to Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport. So we expected that the Beltline would do three things that it would connect, it would be an economic engine to connect over 42 neighborhoods because we are, as I mentioned, a real estate town, mm -hmm. but we are what is called a sprawl real estate town. So we do not have the density of a Chicago or a New York. It doesn't go straight up or San Francisco. It goes straight out. And we didn't put in the transportation infrastructure to match all that development. So we've got people out in the hinterlands. But even in the inner city, most of us stay in our comfort zone. So where we live, we shop, which mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. We still ought to get in our cars mm -hmm. to go to Publix or Kroger, yeah. but we do it in our quadrant of the city, be it southwest, northeast, southeast, whatever. And so what we envision is that the Beltline will connect all the neighborhoods that it runs through. So it's 42 or 48, I can't remember exactly how many neighborhoods, but it provides actually a physical piece of transportation that you can get on and ride to the next place. So for the folks who are at the poverty level, this would be very helpful. It would be helpful to everybody, but certainly those who don't have money to own a car or even buy a MARTA pass, this would be very helpful to move them to the grocery store of their choice. Because we still have food deserts in our city, places where people cannot get fresh vegetables and get fresh meat or fresh fish or whatever it is that they want. They can't do it. We see folks coming um, starting to believe in urban gardening because we have so much land that is just sitting fallow, right? In Vine City, I think 60 or 70 percent of the homes are vacant. Um, they actually live, part of it, a hundred year floodplain exists in Vine City. So there are parts of the community where you shouldn't build again because it's gonna get washed out. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with that? We've not thought about that. I think we haven't recognized it looks just like the Ninth Ward in New Orleans. Okay, if you know that, then put something there that can be replenished as opposed to putting people's homes there. That's just stupid. So when you think about- Stadium? 
farther down the street. <laughs> Not in the floodplain, please. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so what I would tell you is this connectivity, it has the ability to hook up to MARTA. If you allow MARTA to be the spine of a regional transit system, which would be my vision, I haven't talked to anybody about this, mm -hmm. but the MARTA people have heard me make this speech many times. MARTA should be the spine of a regional system. The Beltline should be the circular that connects to MARTA so that it extends MARTA's reach or the public transit reach. That's very, very important for us. The notion that we should have green space and greenery in the city, the Beltline offers how many acres? I can't even remember now because it's out of my head, but I think Arthur Blank and his foundation have paid for an arboretum mm -hmm. that goes all around the entire Beltline. When you fly into Atlanta, what you see is a lush green carpet of trees during the springtime and the fall. We don't see that when you fly into any other mm -hmm. city. So to be able to continue that environmental piece and the parks and green space that go along with those trees and the Beltline is huge. If you live near a park, it drives your property value. Most people don't understand that. So giving folks the opportunity to live near it, participate in the activity that, whether it's walking, riding your bike or whatever, that will be absolutely huge, not to mention the dollars and the jobs that it will create while it's being built over the 24 years. So I think the Beltline, it's a unique uh, tool for Atlanta to say we stand head and shoulders above our peers, whether it's the unique configuration of the green space and the Beltline, or whether it's the connectivity between the neighborhoods or the jobs that it will spawn or the money that will be spent in Atlanta as a result of the construction, it is a hugely potentially beneficial piece to the Atlanta crown jewel. So the economic piece is what most public officials would want to sell. Those in public policy would say, okay, I'm going to increase exercise, I'm going to increase food availability, I'm going to make health care more accessible because all of this stuff will now be connected at some nominal fee and will decrease the need for a car because it will drive folks to MARTA and to using the Beltline. I'm not a believer. Can you tell me? Let me offer you a chance to talk about something I know you're passionate about sure. now. And that's the role of Grady sure. in the city's health care. Absolutely. Um, one of the topics that really has not come up to the extent that it should in our conversation uh -huh. is health care. Mm -hmm. And Grady plays such a crucial role in that. Uh, give folks listening to this a hundred years from now, a little bit of historical context of the importance of Grady Absolutely. in the city's health care picture and bring it sort of up to your role now. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Grady Hospital is an amazing place. Let me first say, I believe health care is a right, not a privilege. So those of you listening a hundred years from now, it's not written into the Constitution, but if I had the ability to write a new amendment, it would be that health care is a right and not a privilege. We, from a public policy standpoint today, treat health care as a privilege. The way we pay for it, the way we deliver it, um, the way we measure outcomes, we treat it as a privilege. So I think that's just absolutely wrong. Grady Hospital, and today is now Grady Health System, was born in 1892. So this organization is 120 years old almost five generations. Henry Grady, who was in his lifetime the editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and an amazing orator, envisioned that we would have a hospital that took care of the city's poor. That vision is still alive and well today. I wish I could say there were no more poor and we don't need Grady. That's just not the case. Folks are poorer than ever and the ranks of the poor are broader than ever, primarily due to this economic recession we have just been through. So that was the primary mission, the original and the primary mission. It stands as the primary mission today. The difference is, in moreover, that we can take care of everybody in the community, not just the poor or the working poor. So we started in a little red brick building 
down at uh, what was then Butler Street and Coca-Cola Place. It's still there. It's on the historic register. There were 110 beds and something like 28 employees. Today there are 953 beds. There are 16 operating rooms. There are 4,200 employees and we practice over 50 specialties and subspecialties at Grady. It is a level one trauma center which it was the only one until last year, which was 2011. To give you some context for that, I think New York has 12 mm -hmm. level one trauma centers in the city. We have one. In the state. Yes. So today we have two, actually, because Atlanta Medical Center became a level one trauma center last June or July. We need more. We don't begrudge Atlanta Medical being a level one trauma center. We would like to have seen that either way up north or way down south of the city, just because why do you put two mm -hmm. right together as opposed to spreading them out? We have bunched our resources. But Grady sees everything and everybody. Illness does not discriminate based on your economic station or based on how tall you are or how short you are. When you have an accident in the city, you have an accident. So most people remember the Olympic Park bombing in 1996, or they remember the bridge collapse at the Botanical Garden, or they remember the Bluffton, Ohio baseball team careening mm -hmm. off of I-75. All those people, or the vast majority of those people, come to Grady and we save lives. That's what we do. We save lives. Most people don't understand and shame on us for not sharing it more. When any president comes, not just the president of the free world today, Barack Obama, comes to the city of Atlanta or comes to the state of Georgia, we are the hospital of choice and reserve an entire floor and an operating room for the entire time that that elected official is in our state. We are the coordinator for all natural and man-made disasters in the city and in the state. So God forbid someone were to hit the Bank of America Tower or CDC, which are the targets for terrorists. We know that because of how tall that building is and what's housed at CDC. Grady is the coordinator for all disasters, natural or man-made. So people just don't understand what the economic value is for Grady. So let me talk a little bit about that. No convention, trade show, sporting event comes to a city without a level one trauma center. They just don't do it. It's not allowed. It doesn't make sense. It's not safe. So Grady performs a significant economic mission in the city of Atlanta. We train 25% of the state's doctors because we are training the residents from Morehouse School of Medicine and the Emory School of Medicine and have done that our entire lives. No one else is doing that but us. So if you did not have Grady, you couldn't have conventions, which obviously the economic benefit that accrues to Atlanta and to the state would go away. We wouldn't have adequate doctors, so that would go away. So the level of quality of care in the state would be significantly and dramatically diminished. Here's the additional piece. Today we see we are taking care of our primary mission, which is the poor and the working poor. We are now expanding our product lines to address the issues of the day. So here's the one that shocked me three years ago, when I had four years ago when I came to Grady, that we have more strokes. We are one of the highest cities in the country in terms of strokes. And it's not just black people. It's black people, white people, short people, tall people, old people, young people. The question becomes, why is that? You know, is it diet? Is it genetics? Is it lack of physical activity? The answer is it's all of that. We live in something called the Bible Belt, oh, excuse me, the Stroke Belt, along with the Bible Belt. We are in the Stroke Belt. Atlanta is called, and that's primarily in the South, Atlanta is called the buckle mm -hmm. of the Stroke Belt because the incidence and prevalence of stroke is so high. The way they used to treat strokes was with a drug called TPA, and they call it the clot buster. So you give it TPA and the clot goes away. Today, we treat it with what we call inside out surgery. They put a catheter in your leg and snake it all the way to your brain, and they bust the clot. So there are doctors called neurointerventionists, and I call them my baby rock stars because they're both like 40 years old, and it looks like they're playing Pac-Man in your head. I can actually <laughs> watch it on a computer while they are doing the surgery. We call it inside out because we no longer crack your chest or crack your head. We go in with this catheter. That line opened last March. I think that's right. No, March of 2010. 
We are now the fifth biggest and busiest stroke center in the country. People don't know. So today you see, those of you listening 100 years from now, this is 2012, you see an outdoor campaign with rap MARTA buses and with billboards saying, when you have a stroke, think one word, Grady. That's all you need to remember is Grady, and we'll take care of the rest. So today, not only are we taking care of our primary mission, we have moved and said we can take care of everyone. There are multiple lines like that, whether you're talking about the award-winning neonatal intensive care unit, the burn unit that takes care of children and adults, and until last year we were the only place that did that in the state. We are the only ones with the poison control center. Anybody's poisoned anywhere in the state of Georgia, it all comes to Grady. The Rape Crisis Center, nobody had one of those 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. We are still running one of the busiest, unfortunately, rape crisis centers in the state of Georgia. So this notion of being a full-blown hospital, a real hospital, not just a hospital of last resort for those who cannot afford to go elsewhere, there is the new Grady today, where healthcare is a right, not a privilege, where we serve you regardless of your station in life or your ability to pay. Fulton and DeKalb counties are the only two counties in Georgia out of 159 that are paying for these services. We service whoever comes through our door. Should we be billing back? Yes, we should, and yes, we do, and yes, we are lobbying on a regular basis for Cobb, Clayton, Henry, Gwinnett, Walton, and everybody else to pay their fair share. We don't mind taking care of everybody. We have no problem with that. But if your people are coming from Walton County and I took care of a thousand of your people, could you please put something in the pot, just a little something? And and that and that as a on the council and so forth. I mean, that's a recurring challenge for Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, Same is true for Marta. Bit about that. I mean, yeah, I mean the short. Sure. Yeah, I mean, whenever I see a Cobb County Transit bus pull up to a Marta station, <laughs> I just want to put my hair out. <laughs> Not only that, we allow, and we in this case would be Marta. We allow Cobb County, last time I checked, to use the MARTA contracts to buy their buses. So they get a better deal because they buy it through MARTA, but then they won't connect to MARTA, or they won't, they won't connect, they won't pay, right, they, won't they won't contribute. Pay. So we still face two Georgias, and everybody Talk talks about, about some of the, all of the different ways that, the, that Georgia, that, that outside of Fulton, and, I mean, Fulton and DeKalb sort of, take care of Absolutely. So, such a larger you know, population. Part of their, yeah. It's true. There are almost 10 million Georgians mm -hmm. now. There are half a million Georgians who live in the city of, of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Fulton and DeKalb counties are your most populous and diverse counties. Gwinnett is sort of fighting DeKalb for that most diverse mm -hmm. uh, label. But Fulton and DeKalb pay the most freight, if you will, for everything. So be it health care, be it public transportation, those of us who live in those jurisdictions, and I live in Fulton, pay the freight for the state, in effect. Because when people leave Georgia and they're on CNN, I don't care what you are, business person, elected officials, the first thing out of your mouth is, I'm from Atlanta. It's like, no, you're not. Nobody's heard of Podunk, Georgia that you're from, so you then claim Atlanta. So we're schizophrenic about holding on and embracing Atlanta. Those of us who live in the capital are like, we're from Atlanta. You know, this is with all our dimples and all our warts. We love Atlanta. Those who are not from Atlanta, I think there is, schizophrenia may be a little bit strong of a word, but I think there is this resentment, this is love-hate relationship with Atlanta, because Atlanta's got the airport that throws off crazy cash, right? It's got Grady that does crazy, amazing things that saves people's lives, and only when it's Nikki Haley or whatever the model's name was or the hockey player that we say, only when we do something magical that goes on CNN do people go, oh yeah. I'm from Atlanta. No, you're not. If you are, and if you're going to claim it and claim the whole state, then claim it all the time. We've got to work on that. There's this little brother, big brother sort of, I'm not sure if I'm the mascot or if I'm part of the family. So the rural parts of the state, and we got to do a better job in Atlanta of embracing the rural parts of the state. We are still basically a community of agrarian roots. We still do tobacco, peaches, peanuts. Those are still our big crops coming out of Georgia, believe it or not. Atlanta and the 14 or 16 counties that surround us and call this the MSA, the Metropolitan Statistical Area, we are in the minority. 
the rural areas are really the majority. And so we have not put our arms around our country cousins, if you will. We are not active about that because we're all polished. We're from the big city. They resent that. They embrace it when it's convenient and they resent it otherwise. And you see it play out in our public policy under the Gome Dome in every legislative session. We are fighting about who's on first and who's on second because they want to play and we are said, you didn't practice enough. You're not going to hit a home run. You cannot come up to bat. That's crazy. If you don't teach them how to bat, if you don't show them the right way, they will never get it. And we will always have this drag on the state. So we are creating the monster that we fear every day in Atlanta. And those in the rural areas, they are not open enough to say, I'm scared. You're bringing all that crazy stuff here. Business, public transportation. I like my trees. I don't want train tracks here. Can I explain to you why that's a good thing? They voted against the legislation last year, primarily in the rural parts of the state, to have level one transport. So we can save you from heart attacks and stroke. Why would you vote against that? They didn't understand that that's what it was, right? We wrote the legislation poorly. We got a New York advertising firm to come in here and talk about it. Yep. That was stupid. So those of you listening 100 years from now, let me remind you we live in the Bible Belt and that there's a church, a mosque, or a temple on every corner in Atlanta. All you had to do was get all the preachers, the rabbis, and the imams up to speed and ask them to get up in their pulpits and explain it in a sermon. It would have passed. Nobody asked me. They hired the people. We paid the money. It failed miserably. I don't know why they ever hire any of these consultants from outside of South, but it happens all the time and it just happened to happen in healthcare. So I guess the answer to your question is there's culpability on both sides of this equation and we don't ever want to admit that we are a house divided in the state of Georgia and until you recognize your problem you can't address it, right? One of the other healthcare challenges that the city and state have faced that Grady's played a key role is infectious disease Say a word about right, that. Grady's role in that. And, sure. And that's a euphemism for HIV. Right. Um, we have a program called the Infectious Disease Program. We call it IDP, affectionately. And we have a huge facility on Ponce de Leon. Those of you listening 100 years from now, hopefully the Krispy Kreme is still there on the <laughs> corner because we are right beside the Krispy Kreme donut shop. Um, but it is a huge facility. We do not put a name on it for all the obvious reasons. We don't want to be picketed. We treat adults and children there who are infected with HIV and AIDS. It is one of the largest oldest and most comprehensive programs in the nation. What Grady has done in this war, if you will, this war on AIDS is just magnificent. The research that we do, not to mention the patients that we service every day, but the research has just been phenomenal. And this is a place we're going to focus on in 2012 and in 2013 is lifting the IDP program. They are, in effect, self-sufficient. They get lots of federal funds, Ryan White and other foundations and funds come to them directly. And so those funds service the patients every day. But we've got some work to do to lift the program. Uh, our own Sanjay Gupta, who operates at Grady and is a CNN anchor and medical correspondent. Most people don't know he operates at Grady every other Tuesday. Shame on us for not telling people. Shame on us for not making Sanjay wear a white coat that has Grady on the side of it when he's talking on TV, but we'll get to that. Um, we have a lot of work to do in this area just to lift the program. The program is phenomenal, just phenomenal. So our work in that area is clearly to eradicate AIDS. You know, we are giving people cocktails today, uh, a variety of medications that they need for all the uh, assaults on the body that HIV and AIDS make because it basically is like Pac-Man. It eats your body and it shuts down your organs. So whether it's your kidneys or your liver or whatever it is, we have medications today. We don't have a way to prevent it other than use a condom and sometimes they break and people don't use them. So we've got to find a better method. Um, it's worse than TB and the things of yesteryear when we came up with penicillin. You know, it's probably analogous to penicillin because that dang near cures everything. And the big gun antibiotics. So when you think about Marie Curie and all those people who did amazing things in centuries before. 
that's where we are in the fight on AIDS. We collaborate with other parts of the world. You know that the French have been working on a cure for AIDS. People on the left coast in California are working on it. Everybody's working on it because it is an, it's a devastating disease. The fastest growing demographic with HIV and AIDS is African American women. Uh, and so women are finally going, okay, wait just one darn minute. You know, heart disease is one thing. This is something totally different. And we have to acknowledge that we're getting it. We have to join the fight against it, as opposed to going literally into our homes and becoming recluses and just dealing with it personally. That certainly needs to be done, and I think there are multiple stages of grief that people go through when they contract this disease. But at the end of the day, the courage really comes and the strength really comes when they come out of their homes and come together and say, all right, this is the face, okay? It's your sister, it's your aunt, it's your mother, it's your grandmother. We gotta fix this because nobody wants a woman to be sick. When I talk to men in the community, they get a little bit jealous about this and they say, well, we've had it for a long time and you guys didn't help us. Okay, let's forget about what happened yesterday. The fight is today, let's all put on our battle gear and let's go for it. Um, so you see people like Alicia Keys today, who's a brilliant artist with the One Campaign, talking about preventing it in babies, right? The One Campaign. We can do things like that when we all come together, when we admit there's a problem and then we bring multiple people to the table, I mean by the droves, to say we're not having this in, in our society okay, today. We need a vaccine. Exactly. So it's NIH and those kind of people that we have to work with, the National Institutes of Health. And frankly, men's diseases get treated first, then women, then children. That's just the hierarchy of it. Children don't vote. <laughs> That's why they're last. We just have to be candid about that. Women do vote. There are more women in this country than men. There are more women in Georgia than men. So women really have the power, if we stand together, to help eradicate what's going on. Lots of women are working on it, too. Working on vaccines over at Emory and places like that. Let me ask you to put on a different hat now and look ahead and think about Atlanta. You've done a magnificent job of describing some of the things, but if you could summarize what makes Atlanta special, what would you say? And then sort of the next question is going to be, what message would you give to future leaders of our city? Sure. Well, thank you for the compliments. I appreciate having the opportunity to, to share my views. I'm not opinionated at all. For those of you listening 100 years from now, I don't want you to use that adjective for me. Um, I would say that what is unique about Atlanta is that we have the ability to look in the mirror and see the wart and address it. It is difficult in any environment to acknowledge your deficits. It is very, very easy to celebrate your successes and your accomplishments. But what we have done historically, and I think we will continue to do, is address our challenges. So what I remember as a child was civil rights and segregation. That was a horrible zit on the face of Atlanta. When I think about today's environment with the economic meltdown, I think about our kids not being able to get jobs. I think about our 25% poverty rate escalating and people literally dying because they don't have food, shelter, and clothing, access to health care, and good transportation. That's what I see today. It's a little bit scary. So when I look back and I look at today and I envision what we would have in the future, I envision leaders who will have the intestinal fortitude, insight, and foresight to actually continue to grapple with our challenges in a proactive way, as opposed to waiting until they devolve until the cancers they can become. We have always had a group of people Many times they were pastors, many times they were pastors and business people, sometimes they were just civic-minded folks, everyday Jane and John Q citizens, who come together to address issues in this city. So there are those who work on the environment, there are those who are working on poverty, there are those who are working on hunger, 
There are many at the elected stage or elective uh, office level who are trying to get their arms around the economics of the next generation and how we prepare for that. So you've got some governance issues that need to be addressed. You've got some public policy as well as some cultural issues that need to be addressed. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And I would say the leadership may change face, but the spirit of Atlanta will never change. Said another way, or parenthetically, as the professor says, the strategy always remains constant. The tactics must be flexible so that we can address the problems as they arise or as we see them on the horizon. The faces of leadership may change, but their ability to, or their capability to handle the challenges should not change. So you've got to have the courage, as Maynard Jackson and Andy Young and Ivan Allen and Sam Massell and Shirley Franklin had to stand up and say, this is not right. It does not bode well for our community to have a high poverty rate or no transportation or inadequate health care or a few jobs. We've got to have everyone doing as well as they can do so that the city moves forward and the state moves forward in a very positive way. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. This has been Thank you for before. asking. This has been so nice. It's always pleasant to sit down with you. <laughs> well, thank you. I have a few thoughts about <laughs> how the world should turn. Yeah, and you know, we need to um, think more. We inter we talked to A.J. Robinson yesterday. Mm. You know, sort of how we kind of think more about getting the message. I actually sort of came away thinking, you know, we need a we need an internal marketing campaign. Mm, for the city, for the for the, for the region. Mm, okay. For the you know for the region, maybe we need to start with the city and then move out yeah. to the region to kind of say you know this is who we are, and this is what you know this is what it um, this is what you have to keep doing. Right. Um, and 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 how to really focus a discussion around um, of quality of life because quality of life and like, and that's part of the purpose of this project is to try to get people to understand this is what our legacy is. This is why the Atlanta you enjoy is mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. people were willing to make these kinds of long view um, strategies and decisions and right. work together and a lot of the people who would work together to make something happen, they didn't personally benefit from it. In fact, they usually didn't. You know, and, and yeah, and some, yeah, we, you know, and so that sense of really working together for the community um, you know, in terms of our, um, our business leaders, our civic leaders, our religious leaders, uh, and how do we bring the, uh, you know, how do we bring the region at least you know, into this mentality, I think you say, like Cobb and Gwinnett. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the, the lead, some of the leaders, and, and I think there's a good, this transportation compact is a good sign mm -hmm. if we mm -hmm. can get it to pass. Well, I think we've almost, we've lost so many things to Charlotte or Birmingham or whoever. And yeah. now we're just, it's the competitive piece of us that says, what? Right. You know, right. Charlotte kept NASCAR and we right. didn't get this and we, so it's we almost. Didn't get, the didn't get Wendy's. Exactly. So it's the, it's, it's almost, it's reactionary at this point, but it's yeah. better than nothing. Right. You know, it's, right. how did right. they get that? Right. You know, what do you mean? I mean, Birmingham yeah. is still fuming about the airport, right? A yeah. hundred years right. ago, but yeah. that's okay. We still got it. It's it not, be. you can't move it. <laughs> yeah, that, um, that was a big loss. Yeah. But, how, you know, but we, but, but, the, but people really, the, the mindset is so, uh, uh, is just not fact-based. Right. And I think a lot of, there is a lot of not selling the real points, and I don't know kind of where that falls apart, but you know, even just in terms of the streetcar, the idea that the real mm. point of the streetcar is economic <coughs> development, it's mm -hmm. not traffic. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, it's the sense of an urban amenity that right. makes you, you know, a place that people want to come live. And I think that's another you know, thing is that people, that if you are going to create jobs and grow 
things. You have to be someplace that people who do that want to be. Well, exactly. And I think this, this notion of, and I'm sorry to be so graphic with the zit on the face of the, um, but we've got to recognize we got a two or three zits right now. Mm -hmm. And we have not recognized that yet. We refuse to look in the mirror, because if you look in the mirror, you can see it. But we refuse to look in the mirror because we know it's there and we want to know how bad it is, but we're scared to look. Um, because if you look, you might be overwhelmed mm -hmm. and go, oh, I don't think I can handle it. Um, but this notion of two Georges, there might even be three Georges, but yeah. until we figure out how to get along with our family members, mm -hmm. we cannot stand as a united front and say to North Carolina, get back, or Alabama, get back, you know, Tennessee. Well, and hopefully, and I think that's something Kasim is doing better. Um, and, and Deal is not the crazy person that, that uh, we have had in this office. Well, he's very pragmatic, yeah. and so is Kasim, yeah. which is very helpful. Yeah. I would want to say, That would be the mayor 100 years from now. I would <laughs> want to say to you, thank you for being a civic leader oh. in the best sense of your family's tradition. And if your father doesn't recognize what a wonderful <laughs> citizen you are and leader carrying on your grandfather's tradition in the city, this is amazing that you're working on behalf of Grady now, that you put your name forward for mayor. And running for office is always a risk. And, and it a takes, task. It takes <laughs> it her dad's done it a couple times. fortitude to put yourself out there the way that you did. And then once the outcome was not what you wanted, to work with Mayor Reed and lead his transition into office, yeah. to work with him on a continuing basis as you've done, and to be an articulate spokesperson for the city's warts and all. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I am, um, my father, before he died, did say to me, uh, I understand who you are today, which is a huge statement for him. And he's just mad I didn't become a doctor. Um, but working for Grady, when I started working for Grady, he was very happy mm. that I did that. Mm. Very, very, and I don't think I told him I was going to do it. I just did it and then said, Daddy, I'm working for Grady now. Because he said, what are you going to do, you know, that you didn't win the mayor's race? And I said, well, I'm going to go raise money for Grady. And he said, well, I think that's amazing, but how are you going to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, that's like really hard. Um, and that was in 2009, right? And so um, before he died, we were not this far along because he just passed away a year and a half ago. But the today's number, I think, we were embarked on a five-year, $325 million campaign for Grady. We were at $319 million in three years, mm -hmm. which is 60% mm -hmm. of the time, 98% of the money, every penny came out of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Not out of Georgia. Out of Atlanta, not one cent of federal money. This was all philanthropic, spirit of Atlanta. Look that ward in the face and pop it. Yeah. You know that was, or that is, the reaction of our community was. We have a problem. Right. Well, what's the problem? How big is the problem? How big? You know. So, I have to say, it's been a blessing for me to have the opportunity to lead this campaign. There's like a mountain of people behind me that are standing right here and are driving the results, but to be in this economic environment, to raise that kind of money in that time period, um, we have been incredibly <coughs> blessed. Um, I have a sight line on the last six million, uh, but to be able to do that, I told Daddy, I said, I am not a clinician, but I think I have been able to impact the clinical environment, because you can't work, you know, no money, no mission. Right. It's just that simple. And the doctors, they don't raise money. That's not what they do. Right. They save lives. They put you back together better than they found you. Well, you know, the story that my dad always tells that when um, he, Jimmy Carter, who was in the White House and being sworn in by Thurgood Marshall as the ambassador mm -hmm. to the UN, and my grandfather told the president, well, if he had been a dentist, he really would have been somebody. <laughs> <laughs>